Good morning. Wow, so great to be with all you folks today. Thank you for the kind invitation to uh, have me speak today. I super appreciate that. Uh, as, uh, as was mentioned, we're here in Ottawa because our daughter Ellie, who has been a, a vibrant part of the church in Halifax, uh, well, since we've lived there, we've moved there over, well, I guess, 12, 13 years ago now, uh, she's been in the campus ministry there, and she's now going to be going to Carleton. And so we're uh, super excited about that, and yeah, amen. So I thank you in advance for all of the, uh, the love and kindness and generosity you're going to show my daughter while she lives here amongst you. Thank you for that. And I, I know that uh, she, I can tell already she's going to love it here. And I super appreciate your enthusiasm this morning as we worship God. Uh, the enthusiasm in our singing, the one-man band, uh, the singers up front here, you know. Uh, I know all that goes on in, in, in a small church and running a, a worship service. You know, the person filling up the little cups at the back, you know, that person doesn't get a lot of praise, but thank you for doing that or whoever did that. Thank you to the sound guys and the audiovisual guys and uh, the ushers and everybody. Thank you for what you do uh, to serve the church. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, as was mentioned, um, my wife and I lead a ministry called Strength and Weakness Ministries. And uh, up until four years ago, I was the evangelist in the church in Halifax, Nova Scotia. My wife and I have been in the full-time ministry for about 20 years, leading different churches in Canada. And then about four years ago, quit our jobs to do this ministry full-time. Uh, it's a ministry that just kind of started as a hobby about 10 years ago. I recognized 10 years ago that we as a church fellowship really had nothing in place to offer support and help to Christians who come from a homosexual background but who now as followers of Jesus still live with unwanted same-sex attractions. And we had no plan in place, no cohesive plan in place as a fellowship on how to reach this really unique demographic in our world, gay, gay uh, men and women. And I thought, we have to do better than this. And there's a lot of people who are, I believe, looking for Jesus, but we're not getting to them. It's not because we don't care, we do care. It's just that this subject has become so controversial, so multifaceted, and so difficult to understand that many Christians have decided to stay silent on this issue. We don't want to put our foot in our mouth. We don't want to insult people. We don't want to lower the traditional biblical sexual ethic. And we don't want to spend all of our time arguing with people. So we figure when it comes to the issue of sexual ethics, and in particular the issues of homosexuality, uh, same-sex attractions, sexual identity disorder, transgender issues, a lot of Christians are like, you know what, I'm not touching that one, no way. Right, I'm just going to stay quiet. But if there's anybody who should have a hope-filled message for this lost and dying world, it should be Jesus' church and the Christians. And so my wife and I now spend the majority of our time traveling around the world, speaking on these issues and educating. We don't have all the answers. We don't have all this figured out, but it, we're just doing the best we can to help create dialogue. Uh, amongst churches around the world. And so when I started the ministry 10 years ago, I, my goal initially was to find 30 people. I thought if I could find 30 Christians who are same-sex attracted, that would be amazing, 30. Wow, what would I do with 30 people? How would I help that many people? But then we found 30 in the first week. And then it went to 100. And then, went, then it went to 500. And then it went past 1,000. And so in the last uh, 10 years now since starting the ministry, we've now helped thousands of Christians in 58 countries around the world, have a volunteer staff of 10 people helping us, and this thing has just become so much larger than we ever thought it would be or even that we wanted. This was not our dream, our intention, or our goal or anything. It's just kind of morphed into something that, you know, like I said, we didn't expect this, but nevertheless, here we are. And so... Uh, Ellie's mom and dad spend their, most of their time traveling around the world speaking to churches like you guys. And uh, so I'm so glad we get to be here with you. But also, this is also the beginning of a relationship for Kathy and I. Not only for my daughter as she visits you for the first time because she's going to be going to school here, but this is a relationship now for Kathy and I. If this is the church that my daughter is in, trust me, you've become very important to me. <laughs> and uh, you're going to see a lot of the Hammonds. We're going to be here a lot to visit. So I'm really excited to get to know you guys better. 
and uh, build on this relationship. Um, one thing that's happened that we weren't expecting with our ministry was that about two years ago, a documentary filmmaker from Texas contacted us and said they wanted to make a documentary about our life and our ministry. We were hesitant at first, but we spent some time in prayer over it, and we thought, okay, yeah, go ahead, let's make this movie, and, you know, we'll see. I don't know. If we wanted to have final rights to say, you know, yes or no to the movie, or even what goes into the movie. And uh, anyway, for the last couple of years now, this documentary filmmaker and a film crew have been following me around to different cities around the world as we teach and speak on these issues. And the movie is in post-production now. It'll come out in November, or October, I believe it is. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, it, it'll be out soon. But uh, we're hoping that, you know, certainly it'll be seen within every church within our fellowship around the world. Guy and Kathy Hammond may not be able to get to every church in the world, but we can get a movie into every church around the world. And then we're really just praying for the Holy Spirit to work to see what his plan or goal, plans are in regards to getting it into the evangelical and denominational world. Because while we may disagree fundamentally on some important issues with the uh, evangelical world, there are many things we do hold in common, and sexual ethics is one of them. And so while they're looking, just like we're looking for answers, they're looking for answers. And we're still hoping that maybe this movie will be a blessing to them too. So I thought I would show you a trailer to the movie, just so that you know that, that it's coming out. And uh, this is something that, again, will be available to churches, but also uh, just for people to personally own if it's something that uh, you want to have. So uh, here is the trailer. Uh, for the movie, as I said, coming out in uh, October. I'll never forget the very first time someone invited me to come and speak on the issue of homosexuality. When I arrived at the event, there were angry protesters everywhere. The 200-seat auditorium was completely packed, and many would even shake my hand or look at me. And by the time I had finished my talk, Dozens of hands shot up, the room got louder, some people started shouting, some were booing. So I just pointed at random to one of the hands at the back of the room. The woman stood up, she introduced herself as the president of the LGBT organization that had planned the protest. And what she said, I'll never forget. Yeah, my house was right here. This was my neighborhood. A lot of things happened in our home that uh, no kid should have to experience. Yeah, it's emotional. It's emotional coming back here again. We try to project the image of the perfect Christian family, but behind closed doors, something completely different was going on. I was a preteen when I first realized that I was attracted to guys. At school, I heard kids throwing around gay, fag, and queer jokes. At church, the only message I heard was how gay people were wicked and evil and going to hell. In a vain attempt to find fulfillment, I started having anonymous encounters with men I met at places like the change room at my local gym, and parked cars and no gay hangouts. I felt God had let me down. Didn't he see what I was going through? Didn't he care? So what was I to do with God in the church now? So I don't take any more time without any further ado, Guy Hammond. You see, what's been happening though for the last 50 years is that these two groups, the gay rights movement and Jesus' church, have been going like this. We've been arguing against each other. There's been no reasonable conversation. I've been verbally attacked, laughed at, mocked, protested, threatened, lied about online and in the press. I can tell you it's been both a humbling and a humiliating experience. And I think one of the challenges is sometimes we're not convinced that Jesus is that amazing. We have to be convinced that Jesus changes lives. I don't know, we'll see. Maybe it'll only be seen by about 10 people, or maybe more. But uh, we'll see what God does with that there. So yeah, be praying for us as we do this ministry and as we travel and speak really about a really controversial and messy issue. It's not easy to uh, travel around the world and speak about the most broken parts of your life, but also talk about something that is so controversial 
that everywhere you speak, you know, you can easily be attacked. Uh, sometimes just by the Christians, actually. <laughs> so not just by the gay rights people. So anyway, keep us in your prayers. Um, open your Bibles, if you would, please, to John chapter 1. We'll be turning there. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 10. We'll be looking there in a moment. And I, I want to... Uh, Actually, I'm finding it really bright in here. Whoever turned the lights back on, if you could just turn a few of them off, if you wouldn't don't mind doing that for me, bro. Thank you. So I, I want to start this morning by introducing you to a man that has affected your life in many, many ways. But chances are high that your knowledge of this guy is very limited. Which is a shame, because without his accomplishments, our daily lives would be considerably different today. His story, however, is really quite remarkable. His name is George Washington Carver. In 1855, a white slave owner in the southern United States bought a 13-year-old girl named Mary. And it's uncertain how many children Mary had, but it is known that by her early 20s, due to the hard life conditions as a young slave girl in the Deep South, she lost three children, two in infancy, and one to smallpox at the age of 10. Her next child was George, who was born during the US Civil War. George's father was a slave on a neighboring farm, and he was killed in a logging accident not long after George Washington Carver was born. The western border of Missouri was the site of considerable guerrilla warfare. And Mary and George, along with the other slaves, were prey to looting by Confederate soldiers. Near the end of the war, a group of men rode onto the land in search of money, and Mary and infant George were kidnapped and taken to Confederate Arkansas. And it was during this time that Mary, young, yet very old, in her 20s, died. So George Washington Carver grew up as a slave in the Deep South in the 1800s with no parents. Not a very auspicious beginning for anyone, is it? However, to make a long story short, George eventually won his freedom as a young man and got himself into school. He received a Bachelor of Science degree from the Iowa Agricultural College in 1894 received a Master of Science degree in 1896. He became a member of the faculty of the Iowa State College of Agriculture and Mechanics. His work with agricultural products have developed industrial applications from farm products. And his research developed 118 products, most of which you and I use every single day. Because of his research and his genius, we owe the inventions of, these are just a few of the things that he invented. Adhesives, bleach, chili sauce, dyes, instant coffee, rubbing oils, soil conditioner, shampoo, shoe polish, shaving cream, refined sugar, synthetic rubber, talcum powder, varnishing cream, wood stains, and by far my most favorite, the most important invention, in the history of the world next to the zipper. <laughs> Peanut butter. See, that's just a few of the products that George Washington Carver invented. He was honored by US President Franklin Roosevelt. A national park has been named after him. He was bestowed an honorary doctorate from Simpson College. He was made a member of the Royal Society of Arts in London. All this from a slave who was brought up without parents in the abusive South in the 1800s. And he has gone down in history as one of the greatest minds of science that the world has ever produced. By the way, he was also really good with his words. He was quite a wordsmith. And some of the greatest quotes that you'll ever read come from George Washington Carver. For instance, here's one of my favorites. How far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic 
with the striving and tolerant with the weak and strong because someday in your life, you will have been all of these things. <laughs> That's awesome, eh? You know, I love stories like this. Someone who beats the odds, who won't listen to the critics, who overcomes unbelievable odds to become something that everyone else would have thought is completely impossible. You know, the world is actually full of stories of complete failures. Before Walt Disney built the empire that we have today, he was actually fired by a newspaper editor because, quote, and I'm not kidding, he lacks imagination and has no good ideas. <laughs> of course, you've never heard of this woman. She was fired from her job as a television reporter because, I'm not joking, she was told, you're not fit for TV. Lady Gaga was fired only three months after making her first record deal because they didn't think anyone would buy her music. In 1973, a man by the name of Stephen King, he was an English teacher in Maine. And being a teacher wasn't quite enough to be able to make ends meet. There was always more month than money. And so he, he wrote short stories on the side. And then he wrote his very first novel. He called it Carrie. And he went around and he received 30 rejections. 30. He was so discouraged, he went home to his wife, he said, that's it. I'm throwing my book Carrie out. I'll never write another book again. Obviously, I'm a complete failure as an author. However, at the urging of his wife, please, honey, don't quit. Please, honey, give it one more try. He submitted the manuscript to Doubleday Publishing. Well, and the rest is history. As of last year, total sales for King's book stand at around 350 million copies, and he's worth just over a billion dollars. You see, all these people started as those who were thought of as complete derelicts, not possible of accomplishing anything great. They were all untalented failures. Yet all of these people, Walt Disney, Oprah Winfrey, Lady Gaga, Stephen King, George Washington Carver, all believed that they had the power to become something different than who they currently were. In talking about Jesus, John tells us in John chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Get this, verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The American Standard Version says it like this. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. You see, no matter how low you have sunk, no matter what you're guilty of, you see, Jesus gives you and I the power to become something new. You see, I'm an expert at this because I'm a mess. God knows all too clearly what I'm really like. He sees all the sin, the hurt, the insecurities, warts and all. And it's easy for me when I look at who I really am before God, when he sees all my failures that are glaring for him to see, for me to feel like I'm a failure, unable of doing anything great with my life. You know, you can see from the brief trailer of what a mess I made of my life uh, before I became a Christian. By the time I was 24, my life was a complete disaster zone. It would have been thought impossible, actually, 
had people known how I was really living, to think that I could become a Christian, someday become an evangelist, get married, have a family. It's unbelievable. And I've got a lot of other issues and challenges even now just today. Honestly, I do. If you were to know me very long, you'd know, oh yeah, Guy Hammond, he's got challenges and problems. I mean, I sin all the time. Uh, I, I've got struggles and weakness and areas of brokenness all over the place. Uh, I got a lot, lot of little issues. Like, for instance, last night when we went over to Howard and Karen's house for dinner, they know me well enough that, that when they fed me, they had to feed me on a plate that has dividers because I can't have my food touch. I know. I can't have the juice from one food touch another food or it'll ruin my, like, you don't understand. Like, my head will explode. My poor wife, every time she makes me a meal, it's got to be a certain kind of meal where everything is separated. The juice of this kind of food can't touch this. And I've sometimes got to eat on several different plates because, you know, like seriously, I've got issues, right? I, I, I got a thing with feet. I don't know why. I, I don't want to see feet. I don't want to smell feet. I don't want to touch feet. Keep your feet to yourself. I don't know. Maybe something bad happened to me when I was a kid with someone's feet. I don't know. But I got a thing with feet. I mean, I got challenges, you know. I'm, I, I'm, I look like a walking gorilla, right? I'm six foot four, 300 pounds. I was so ugly when I was born, the doctor slapped my mother. Like, I've got issues, okay? So, you know, what do you do with this, a person that is this messed up, that has got this many challenges? You know, sometimes we can be guilty of actions or even thoughts that are so life altering so shocking, so awful, that no one can rescue us. Not our friends, not our family, not our church community, not even ourselves. Maybe you're even there now, wondering how on earth you can put the pieces back together again. I don't know, have you ever cheated on your spouse? Are you secretly in love with another man or woman who isn't your spouse right now? Have you so damaged your relationship with your children that they no longer speak to you? Did you cheat your way through school? Have you sold your body for sex or just given it away for free? Do you have an addiction to porn or to sex? Are you prejudiced against white people? Black people, Chinese people, Muslims, you fill in the blank. Have you, have you been faking an illness to get attention? Are you greedy? Are you an expert at ruining relationships? Are you a selfish, self-absorbed person who has to have his or her own her way? Have you had multiple abortions? Or maybe you're a bully at home where you verbally abuse and terrorize your wife and children? Are you a bitter, angry person who refuses to forgive and is consumed with hate and revenge? Do you love to spread gossip, slander? Are you an alcoholic? Do you steal from work? Do you have a foul mouth dropping F-bombs and telling filthy jokes at work or at school that you would never tell at church? Did you get your girlfriend pregnant and urge her to get an abortion to cover it up? Do you lie to the government and steal from them by cheating on your taxes or submitting claims for benefits that you're not legally entitled to? Are you a self-righteous, sanctimonious, judgmental jerk that no one can stand being around? Have you ever participated in mob violence? Have you ever perverted justice? Have you ever shoplifted? Have you told so many lies that you don't know what is true anymore yourself? Is there something from your past that has been haunting you that only you know about and now you live in fear that the truth someday will sneak out and ruin your life? You see, I dare say you found yourself somewhere in that list. Yet somehow, Jesus is able to look at all of that, sin and all, and believe 
that we can become so much more than who we are right now. In fact, he says he gives us the power to become so much more than who we are right now. You see, God believes that there is so much more to you than your sins, your mistakes, your failures, and the worst parts of your life. The Bible is filled with examples of God longing to make us rich spiritually. When Luke says in chapter 17 that the kingdom of God is within us, what is that but another way to say that you and I have the power to become? When Paul in Philippians says that we can do all things through him who gives us strength, what is that but another way of God saying that he is giving you the power to become? When John tells us that faith overcomes the world, is he not saying that no matter what you've been through, no matter what challenges you've faced, whatever failings you've participated in, whatever mistakes you have made, is this not another way of God saying, yes, but I am giving you the power to become something different? You see, Jesus, when he was in the world, always saw the potential in people. He saw people as diamonds in the rough, needing only to be refined and polished. And don't think for a moment the potentiality in Jesus is a respecter of persons. Don't think that you are too young and therefore you will be overlooked by God. A lot of times we can think like that. Well, I'm 15. I'm 20. 25. What's God going to do with my life? I, you know, I, I sit in the back. I don't really, I don't, know, I don't know what God's plan is. I don't really have a plan. I don't know. I'm too young. And yet I put before you that Mozart composed a symphony when he was six. Shakespeare started writing when he was 14. And Daniel if you ever want to read an amazing book that rivals anything you'd ever see on the screen, read the story of Daniel. He was taken into captivity when he was 12 years old. And don't think that you're too old either. Ah, oh, I've been around a long time. You know, I remember 20 years ago when I did this great thing for God. And you keep telling that same story. Oh yeah, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And a lot of times we can begin to think, oh, I'm 40, I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 70. I'm gonna start ramping things on down. I mean, don't worry, I'll, I'll still come to church. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, and I'll give. And, oh yeah, that, yeah I, I, I paid my dues. I, I, my, my greatest days are behind me. And some of us might even be happy with that. Oh yeah, that was, oh yeah, when I was 30 and 40, I had the energy for that, you know, but not now. I'm just gonna kind of sail on off into retirement, spiritual retirement. I'll still be there and everything, don't worry, I'll be a support, I mean, you know. And we can begin to think God's done with us, our greatest days are past. And do you know that Moses' ministry didn't start until he was 80. <laughs> Moses' ministry started when he was 80. It started at 80. And what a failure. Have you ever thought that you've just sinned too much? That it's just too late for you? That the mistakes or the sins or the bad decisions that you have made have just hurt too many people. You've destroyed too many relationships. You have caused too much pain. That the consequences have been too significant. That the sin was so deep and dire that there's really no longer any hope for you. That recovery and reconciliation is now just impossible. You know, if you were to take a tour of the Old Testament, 
you would repeatedly see that the featured people of the Bible have prominent dysfunction in their lives. And that's not the exception. It's the norm. And when we talk about the great lives of the Bible, and there's many of them, but the one thing that amazes me is how many of these great lives were actually lived by really damaged people with serious family issues who were guilty of making terrible decisions with their lives. I mean, if you think that you've made some bad choices, or if you think you were raised in a dysfunctional family, or if, like me, you're still trying to maybe deal with some bad decisions from your past, consider some of these people from the Old Testament. Cain, the first recorded born human being, murdered his brother. Noah, the last, the last righteous man on earth, was a drunk, Genesis chapter 9. Abraham, the forefather of the faith, let other men walk off with his wife. Not once, but twice, Genesis 12 and 20. Sarah, the most gorgeous woman by popular opinion, let her husband sleep with another woman and then hated her for it, Genesis 16. Jacob, who wrestled with God. I mean, the guy was pretty much a pathological liar. I mean, every time you read about Jacob, the guy's lying about something. Genesis 25, 27, 30, and 31. Rachel, who wrote the book on love at first sight, was a nomadic kleptomaniac who stole from her father. Genesis 31. Reuben, the pride and firstborn of Jacob was a pervert who slept with her, with her father's concubine, Genesis 35. Aaron, who watched God triumph over Pharaoh, he suffered a colossal case, gazuntite, of amnesia, and formed a wicked idol that led Israel into sin, causing the death of thousands, Exodus 32. Samson was hopefully enmeshed with a disloyal wife, and while it might be argued that Samson was the strongest man in the world, he certainly wasn't the brightest. Every time I read the story of Samson, I'm like, are you serious? This guy was an idiot. He might have had some brawn, but the man certainly had no brains. Right? I mean, the elevator did not go all the way to the top. The cheese was slipping off the cracker. He was not the brightest light in the harbor. You know what I'm saying? He ended up committing suicide. Saul, the first and powerful king of Israel, was apparently a psychotic with manic outbursts of anger, episodes of deep depression, and traces of paranoia. He too committed suicide. 1 Samuel 16, 18, 19, and 31. David, the friend of God, imagine having that on your resume. Concealed his adultery by murdering the woman's husband, 2 Samuel 11. The prophets, even as they spoke for God, these guys struggled with impurity, depression, unfaithful spouses, and broken families. So, we might find ourselves asking in Ottawa in 2017, where is the edification of this list of warped examples? This is only proof that some of the greatest lives of the Bible who inspire us thousands of years later are also some of the messiest lives of the Bible. It's proof that God can, will, and longs to work through every single one of our lives to do something great for him. All through history, regardless of people, who people were, God always had the ability to see people not as who they were, but who they could be. He saw beneath a fisherman's crude exterior the heart of a flaming evangelist who would one day speak and preach with such enthusiasm he would convert 3,000 people on one day. He saw in the person of a hated tax collector the qualities of loyalty and devotion which made for a faithful disciple from where we get the first book of the New Testament. He saw in the blackened heart of a woman caught in the act of adultery the ability of one to change her ways forever. 
He even saw untold possibilities in the heart of Judas, who, however, declined to capitalize on the power to become and instead became the man who might have been. I love this quote. For all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. What a tragedy the Bible would have been had Matthew or Peter or Paul not used the power they had to become what they did. Every day, you write another chapter of your life. You have no power to rewrite yesterday's chapter. You have no power to rewrite what happened last week, last month, last year, five years ago, ten years ago, thirty years ago. But you have before you right now, this very second, before you a blank sheet, and it will be written one way or the other. My question to you is what are you going to write moving forward? You know, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, I love this. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises. Get this. Are you ready? You're not even ready for this. You're just waiting for the, the potluck. I know. But just listen to this verse because it's mind-boggling. Okay? Ready for this? Listen. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you, you, may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of this world caused by evil desires. You get to participate in the divine nature of God? You? Me? Seriously? With all of our sins and brokenness and weakness and struggles and challenges? Whether you're working in an office, whether you're a student, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, maybe you're unemployed, whatever. God doesn't look at any of that stuff. He doesn't care about how much money you have in the bank account. He doesn't care what kind of degree you have. He doesn't care about anything. He just knows he wants to use your life to go do something great for him. And he lets you participate in the divine nature of God. Listen, God expects you to be holy. You know why? Because you can. You, do, you participate in the divine nature of God. He expects you to be pure. Because you can. He expects you to respect your husband's wives because you can. He expects you, husbands, to love your wives, to be gentle and kind to them, and love them like Jesus loved the church because you can. He expects you to repent of your anger and your gossip and your slander because you can. He tells you to stop lying because you can. He expects you to conquer your moods because you can. He tells you to stop being critical because you can. He tells you to be self-controlled because you can. He tells you to make wiser choices about the people you, you hang out with or who you give influence to in your life because you can. He tells you to forgive because you can. He tells you to start over because you can. You see, all of this is possible if you're a Christian allowing yourself to participate in the divine nature of God. David, a lowly shepherd, became a king. Gideon, the least in his family, led armies. Peter, an unschooled fisherman, along with 11 other guys, changed the world. And it is from the dreams of ordinary men and women that God wants to use to change the lives of people in this city, in your communities, at your school, at your workplace on your block. You know, one thing I don't want every people to say about Guy Hammond is, ah, what might have been. You know, one day, sooner than later, I'm afraid, I'm going to die. And there's going to be a funeral. And people will do what we all do at funerals. The casket's going to be at the front. And at the night of the visitation, and I, I told my wife I want to make sure there's a lot of good food there, so don't worry. You, people will come up to the casket, you know, as they do, and they'll look in the casket and they'll see me lying there. They'll say uh, maybe a few words. I'll be listening. And they'll say to the guy beside him, they could say this, 
Guy Hammond. Hmm. Wow. What a good guy. Wow. A lot of challenges and difficulties in that man's life. If he had only used those to do something great for God. Wow, that's too bad. What might have been, eh? Didn't really do much, did he? No, no, he didn't, did he? No. Oh, well, let's go get a sandwich. <laughs> Could be that. I don't want that. The last thing I want people to say at my funeral is, Guy Hammond, ah, uh, that's too bad. What might have been? I don't want people to be able to come up and look at my casket and say, wow, I'll tell you what, that guy was a mess. Did you know that his food couldn't, couldn't touch and he didn't like feet? Like, that guy was a mess. He had all these challenges, weakness, areas of brokenness. Do you know he lived a gay life before he became a Christian? What a mess that guy was. Holy smokes. But I'll tell you what. I'll say this about this guy. As, as messed up as his life was, wow, look at what he did with his life anyway. Look at how he allowed God to use his life to do something great for God. Man, I'll tell you what. At least he, he certainly tried to help a few people. I'll give him that. Like, anything but what might have been. As you live your life, as you write the next chapter of your life, as you write this next chapter of the Ottawa Church of Christ, what are you going to write? Don't ever let it be said about the Ottawa Church of Christ. Ah, that's too bad. What a group, great group of people. But, ah, what might have been. No, you have before you a blank sheet of paper. God wants to use your life in this church to go do something great for him. Let him do that. Because that's the God we worship. The God who believes we can become so much more than who we are right now. George Washington Carver, Walt Disney, Oprah Winfrey, Lady Gaga, Stephen King, all people from whom seemingly there were small beginnings, but who made huge mistakes in their lives and ended up anyway doing incredible things for God. How much more for you and I in Christ, when we get to participate in the divine nature of God himself. God looks at your life and he doesn't see your mistakes and failures. I want to tell you something. God thinks so much about you, is so crazy about you, and loves you so much that he would rather have you with all of your problems, difficulties, challenges, and insecurities and failings than not have you at all. He just wants to do something great with your life. He longs to show you mercy every day, and he's crazy about you. And he believes you have the power to become so much more than who you used to be, and even so much more than who you are right now. My prayer is you'll give God the ability to be able to move powerfully in your life. Amen.